Hey everyone, so today we're going to talk about antivirals and antifungal medications. So firstly, we have to define what a viral infection is. So essentially, viruses are infectious agents which must infect living cells in order to replicate. So they can't live unless they're in the presence of living cells so they can propagate themselves. Uh, the continued replication of a harmful virus in the body is called a viral infection. So we're gonna go over three different types of viruses today, and then we're gonna move on to antifungals. So firstly, let's talk influenza, otherwise known as the flu. Um, I should caveat this too. Um, because we don't have any therapeutics for COVID yet, uh, although at this time, what is it? It's October 12th. 2021. Uh, assuming I redo this video again sometime in the future, we might have some therapeutics for COVID uh, aside from just supportive care at this time. However, we do not have a pill, although they're looking into approving one right now. Anyway, let's start with the flu. This is something we can help treat with a pill. Uh, it's influenza. It's a contagious respiratory illness that infects the nose, throat, and sometimes the lungs. Now, herpes simplex is another one you're probably quite aware of. It's a group of herpes viruses, which might produce uh, a number of different types of infections, namely cold sores, those are probably the most common, genital inflammation, or, or conjunctivitis. And lastly, we have HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus, and that's a virus which attacks the body's immune system. So we're going to go over drugs for all three of those viruses. Now, antivirals for influenza. The main one and the only one that falls into our list of the top 200 drugs is Tamiflu, otherwise known as Oseltamivir as a generic. Now, it is the most popular antiviral medication for the treatment of influenza, although there are some others, and it is virostatic or virostatic, meaning it inhibits the ability of the influenza virus to replicate. By stopping the virus from replicating, the duration of the flu uh, is not as long. So. You begin taking Tamiflu within 48 hours of beginning of flu symptoms. So your flu symptoms would be fever, uh, nausea, chills, muscle aches, cramping, that kind of thing. Anyone who's had the flu knows it's a very, very miserable experience. So the good thing about Tamiflu is if you start taking it within that 48 hour window, it works uh, best to stop the influenza virus replication early on in the infection. So right when you start feeling sick, if you take Tamiflu, it shortens the duration of your illness, your, your flu. So when you may have had flu-like symptoms for a week to 10 days, maybe you only have it for five days while taking Tamiflu, and they might not be as severe. Normally, uh, Tamiflu is taken 75 milligrams by mouth twice daily for five days. Now, the side effects of Tamiflu I think it's kind of redundant to even talk about them considering you're going to be much more miserable having the flu and you'll probably have these side effects anyway, but it is possible to have side effects with Tamiflu and that is nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, stomach pain, as well as fatigue, but you have the flu. You're going to be in bed all day anyway, and you shouldn't be trying to transmit it to anyone else. So you should be staying home in bed, having some chicken soup anyway. Anyway, we also move on to antiviral drugs for herpes simplex virus. Uh, these are pretty well tolerated, generally good drugs that work to treat any iteration of the herpes virus, acyclovir or Zovirax, and valacyclovir or Valtrex. You'll notice, too, a lot of the antiviral drugs end in VIR, so look for that VIR suffix when you're looking for your antivirals or if you're trying to determine if a drug is potentially an antiviral medication. Now, side effects for both acyclovir and valacyclovir include nausea, abdominal pain, headache, dizziness, depression, fatigue, and the potential for skin rash. Uh, it's also, they're very, very heavily processed in the kidneys. So anyone taking either acyclovir or valacyclovir, it should be advised to drink plenty of fluids while taking these drugs that reduces the risk of kidney in injury. Also, you're most likely gonna be de dehydrated uh, if you're, uh, you're, you're more likely to dehydrate too when you're taking these drugs. So it's very, very good to make sure you are adequately hydrated to begin with. Now, HIV is a fairly complicated virus. They're not going to expect that you know a whole bunch about the therapeutics for the exam, but it does fall into the top 200 drugs. And there's a good chance you'll also see HIV medications if you're working as a farm tech in a hospital as well. So HIV is a virus which attacks the body's immune system. 
you can see it actually there on that um, little electron microscope image, those little green cell, well, they're not even cells, those little green dots, those are the, that's the HIV virus right there attaching to the cells. So you can see how tiny it is. That's on a white blood cell right there. So there, there are different stages of infection. There's acute, uh, chronic, and AIDS. So only, and I, I should point out that only antigen or antibody testing, so only a lab test can diagnose HIV. Oftentimes people with HIV, unless they're in the acute stage or they're in the AIDS stage, which is sort of the, the, the worst stage of HIV, if they're in the chronic stage, many times these people are asymptomatic, they might not even feel that anything is wrong with them. So they'll only notice when they start getting sick. Now, the stages of infection, acute HIV, uh, what happens with that is you might have flu-like symptoms for a few days up to a week, and that's when the uh, infection first starts spreading within the body. Chronic HIV can even last for years with little to no symptoms. And if untreated, HIV begins to weaken the immune system enough to lead to AIDS, which is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So HIV is the name for the actual virus. AIDS is the name for the syndrome, which you get if the virus is left untreated. There is no cure for HIV, but it certainly can be managed. That is incredible considering how far we've come since the 1980s when the uh, HIV and uh, AIDS really became a worldwide pandemic and it was almost a death sentence. So nowadays uh, HIV is absolutely curable, well not curable, but treatable uh, with medications. So symptoms of HIV, with acute HIV, it's mostly flu-like symptoms However, many individuals with acute and chronic HIV infections are completely asymptomatic. They show no symptoms. So that's why it's important to encourage testing for people who are especially at risk for contracting HIV, whether it is uh, men who have sex with men, um, uh, people who use uh, injectable drugs, uh, illicitly most likely. Many other uh, symptoms could include with chronic HIV as well. This is a example down here of uh, what's called Kaposi sarcoma. These are these little sort of skin rashes and lesions, which normally only appear in either very, very specific um, Ashkenaz, Ashkenazi Jewish populations, or they would appear in severely immunocompromised people. So when perfectly healthier people in the 1980s started developing these, with no previous history of cancer risk or anything, they realized that this was most likely an opportunistic effect infection. So when the body's immune system is so destroyed by untreated HIV, it can no longer treat and prevent these opportunistic infections, which are otherwise easily snuffed out by the body's immune system in a person with a healthy immune system. These infections are opportunistic because they take the opportunity of a weakened immune system to strike down these uh, otherwise perfectly healthy people who should not be affected by these very otherwise very, very treatable and preventable diseases. So we have what's called antiretroviral therapy for HIV, slightly different than antivirals. They're, many times they're just tablets that you see, like the ones like Truvada that you see right there. They restore and preserve the immune system. And they also suppress the HIV viral load. That's what they're going to test for. If they get lab tests for HIV, they're going to test for the viral load or how much HIV virus is in the body and blood. Uh, they want to make sure they keep that HIV viral load to undetectable. Undetectable is equal to untransmissible. If you are undetectable, you can uh, conceivably have uh, relations with your partner who is not HIV positive while taking precautions and you will not transmit the virus. Likewise, when HIV is adequately managed, even in pregnant women, uh, as long as she is has a, a um, undetectable viral load, she will not pass that HIV down to the baby. So it's incredible really to notice how far we've come. The ultimate goal of antiretroviral therapy also is to prolong survival and to prevent the transmission of the virus. Now, the two drugs that you see most often are called Bictarvi and Truvada. And you'll notice right away, these are a whole bunch of combo drugs. So there are a bunch of antivirals, and antiretroviral therapies that are all smushed together into one pill, which work to disrupt the HIV virus and its replication in a variety of ways. 
what you see most often is bictegravir, entenofovir, alafinamide, as well as emtricitabine, and that's bictarvi. Then you have tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, which is just another salt of tenofovir, and emtricitabine put together, and that's Truvada. Those are the ones you see the most, but there are many, many others that you do really do not have to bother memorizing, but it's good that you know. Uh, Trimec, Genvoia, Strivald, and Atripla are all pretty commonly seen. Now, there's many counseling points for HIV therapy, but the most, most, most important is adherence. Now, adherence is that you take your medication on time, daily, every day, just as it's prescribed. Antiretrovirals need to have a 95% adherence rate in order to be effective long term. So, if you're taking your HIV medication once daily, then you need to make sure that out of every 100 days, you are taking it on that time daily, 95 out of those 100 days. You need 95% or better for it to be effective and to keep that viral load down. Because HIV, as I said, you can't cure it, you can only treat it. So it's always gonna be there. It's the job of constant monitoring and constant antiretroviral therapy to keep that disease in check. Now, HIV drugs might not just be prescribed for patients who have already been infected with HIV. We also have what's called pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. You can see that there was a very big national uh, TV campaign that the folks over at Descovy did, uh, which you may have seen it where they're saying like step up and prep up uh, right down there. And so patients who are at risk for being exposed to HIV, whether it's um, people who, uh, men who have sex with men, it could be um, uh, gay and lesbian populations, it could be people who are IV drug users, such as they might be using unclean needles, uh, people who are receiving blood transfusions, even people who work in a healthcare field where they might be exposed to HIV pathogens or have a needle stick. Oftentimes, if someone is trying to recap a needle in the pharmacy and they don't follow the proper procedure and they anti accidentally stick themselves with the needle after they give a vaccine, then they're going to have to go on a PrEP regimen because they have a high risk of um, exposure. Well, actually, no. <laughs> Sorry, I should correct that. They would be going on a PEP regimen because that's post-exposure prophylaxis. So they're going to go on PEP, not PrEP. So PrEP is to prepare if you are exposed to HIV. PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, is to prevent HIV infection if you have a possible exposure. So that would be after you've had a needle stick or after maybe you find out that your partner tests positive for HIV. Now, sometimes HIV patients take prophylactic antibiotics as well. That's usually Bactrim if they are immunocompromised, and that prevents those opportunistic infections from occurring uh, with their weakened immune system. So it's just an added level of protection to avoid them from getting uh, too sick. And as I said earlier, undetectable equals untransmittable. If you monitor that viral load closely and the lab tests are essential and you stay adherent and you reach an undetectable level of HIV in the body, you can pretty much be living a normal life. Now, counseling points for antiretrovirals, adherence again, extremely important. They do, however, have significant interactions with other drugs, which may decrease or increase the concentration of other drugs in the body. So again, it is super important to monitor every single drug that a person taking antiretroviral therapy, those Truvada, those Victarvis, whatever they are taking, you need to monitor that. Because if you do not, there's a possibility that the drug is not going to work properly within the body to completely and adequately suppress HIV. And that puts a person at risk for developing a higher viral load, opportunistic infections, and AIDS. Now, the nasty side effects that come along with the antiretroviral drugs are nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, uh, very similar to antibiotics in that regard. There are also metabolic abnormalities like lipids and glucose, and that might lead to weight gain or weight loss, depending on what drug you're taking. Um, it could also lead to insomnia, skin rash, and also hyperpigmentation. So you might have darker blotches on your skin after taking these. Now, you must also test for genetic mutations before giving certain drugs. There's one drug called Abacavir that is actually very, very, uh, it can be potentially toxic to people who have a certain mutation. So you cannot give it to that patient until you sequence that part of their genome and you see if they have a specific allele or a specific gene 
which may cause them to experience a back of your toxicity. And then of course, as you see, if there was anything with a back of your in it. So if they had that specific um, problem with uh, taking a back of your, they of course could not take Triamec or any other thing that was containing a back of your. Now let's move on to fungal infections. And you're welcome that I did not include any pictures on this slide. Fungi are microorganisms that include molds and yeasts, and they can sometimes get into the body and cause some problems. They're most common with skin infections. I'm sure you guys have heard nail fungus, athlete's foot, jock itch, and ringworm, all great stuff to discuss. Uh, UTIs may also be fun fungal in nature, as well as candidiasis, a vaginal yeast infection, or other yeast infections in the body, uh, such as the mouth, the throat, or other places. Side effects of antifungal drugs generally include GI issues, mostly nausea, stomach pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. With fluconazole especially, it's important that the patients know that it might change their urine and secretions to be much darker than they would expect, so make sure to tell them that. It's not necessarily anything for them to worry about. It's just the side effect of the medication that they might expect. Now, speaking of fluconazole, that's most common in yeast and UTI infections. So it makes sense why it would change the urine color, right? Right, Because it's working in the uh, urinary tract. And often fluconazole is just one pill. One pill can sometimes just knock out a urinary tract infection. It's that simple. Tablet, liquid, or injection. Uh, then we also have itraconazole or sporinox. You can kind of remember that that's an antifungal because fungi have spores. That's what their reproductive um, sort of equivalent to eggs and seeds that help them spread. They spread by spores. And uh, itraconazole comes in ta capsule, tablet, and liquid. Really useful for yeast infections and of the mouth and throat as well. Ketoconazole or nizoral. That's a treatment, a cream, or a shampoo. So it's quite good for fungal scalp infections. Uh, that's when you would use the shampoo with it, as well as for treating athlete's foot and ringworm. And lastly, we have nystatin. Nystatin's super common because it treats oral thrush when mixed in a solution. So a lot of times you'll see a nystatin powder that will have to be reconstituted by the uh, patient. They put it into a solution, sort of gargle with it, and uh, that can treat the oral thrush infections, which is just this uh, little fungus, looks like little white blotches, almost like strep throat, but not. It's just like these white blotches on the, the tongue and back of the throat that need to be treated. Um, nystatin cream is also useful for fungal skin infections, as you can see right down there. Uh, it's 10,000 units of nystatin per gram. It looks like a lot, but it really isn't. And it's available in almost every topical and oral dosage form. So you'll see nystatin quite a bit. And that is the end for our antifungal drugs and antiviral drugs. As always, email me with any questions. Thank you.